Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my colleagues and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Marcus D'Ambrosio. Marcus is the Chief Operating Officer of Adirect, a company that makes muscle-inspired hydraulic actuators. Yeah. Marcus, welcome to the pod. Thanks, Spencer. Yeah, appreciate you having me. Appreciate you coming on. Mm-hmm. So um, how'd you get the idea for uh, your product? Yeah, so our technology is based on actually a really old style of actuator called McKibben muscles. It was invented in the 1950s, so many decades ago, actually, probably by someone named McKibben or something like that. I couldn't find any history on that specifically. But um, yeah, they've actually been around for a long time, Uh, but they've never really been commercially viable. And essentially, we've improved upon this existing design pretty substantially. And we believe we have a very strong position to actually utilize these in much broader applications than they ever have been before. That's cool. So does the McKibben muscle include like the pneumatic ones as well and, and kind of any muscle that like it's the outer sheath that, you know, helps it contract and you've got like a rubber bladder on the inside basically. Yeah, exactly. No, that that's, that's exactly correct. So any, any McKibben muscle can be any type of fluid, whether it's air, oil, water, you know, whatever, but it has that rubber bladder inside and it has a braided sleeve outside and as you know, you expand, or, or sorry, pressurize the bladder, which expands radially, causes that sleeve to contract axially. So ultimately it behaves somewhat similar to a human muscle, um, all things considered. So, yeah. Sweet. Mm-hmm. Where did you get the idea to do that? So now, now you've explained it, like, was it like a school thing that you decided to commercialize? Yeah, no, 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 I get what you're saying. Yeah, so yeah. the background, and that part I will put on uh, or, or give credit to my partner, Joe, who cool. is kind of the the inventor more or less of our technology for sure um and he was working on this as a passion project originally in college um it spawned as a very like mission driven thing because he had a family member with als who unfortunately had a lot of mobility deterioration um and that inspired him to build better exoskeletons right to help with that but he very very quickly learned that the actuators in exoskeletons or that were even available period um, were limiting, the, the limiting factor. Um, they were too heavy or too large, whatever it might have been. So, yeah, exactly. You know, obviously, right? Um, everything can be smaller and lighter. And, and that's when he decided to look at some alternatives, like very, very alternative actuators, not your classic EMA or, or cylinder of whatever kind, you know. Um, did a lot of research. Yeah, man, I'm guessing an electromechanical actuator. Um, yeah, exactly. That was like, that's like the classic like kind of... Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. No, like your, your classic like rotary EMA is what almost every exoskeleton today uses, but they're still like, they're kind of heavy. They're yeah. not well, small. Some of those things draw like two kilowatts. Exactly. Example, like, they're not very efficient. Right. Yeah. And, and you know, essentially Joe decided, and, and I, I guess I can speak more wholly for the company. Like we just decided there has to be something better, you know, and, and that's where um, we deviated to this world of alternative actuators specifically the whole artificial muscle thing, you know, fits well into the idea of exoskeletons, right? At the time, that was the main focus. Um, but they weren't good enough yet. As I explained, we set out to really improve them and, and break ground on that existing design. And that's how we got to where we are today, now focused on exoskeletons still, but also prosthetics, a uh, variety of robotic applications, and in the future, um, aerospace, heavy equipment, Harder to, to enter industries for sure, but that's on the roadmap. So cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, so I guess uh, you recently relocated the company from Reno, Nevada to Salt Lake City, Utah. What precipitated mm-hmm. that move? And uh, I guess what's it been like kind of relocating a business? I've- yeah. Yeah. No, that's a good question. Um, so it was something we thought about, we had been thinking about for a while. Um, Reno is a good place. Like I like Reno. I didn't mind living there and I didn't mind having the company there. And we still do have an office there. I still go there frequently just for disclosure, 
Sure. The state invested in our company, so like we have to have an office there still, gotcha. right? Which is fine because we do like it there. We still have employees there, um, but ultimately we didn't see it as a, a super viable place for us in the long term. Um, the entrepreneurial ecosystem is still very new. There is not much of any emphasis on robotics or or anything like super relevant. Not like Salt Lake is a huge robotics hub either, but um, we kind of looked at it as where are the nearest um, cities to grow our startup and it was like the valley obviously or like la you know socal maybe and then you look at how much it costs to live and operate a business there and it's just like all right that's not going to happen you know um or or it, we would have had to change everything to make that happen so salt lake is where a lot of our investors already were salt lake's where i'm from so we moved it back there the whole team wanted to move there from a, a personal perspective anyway we can recruit great talent there um cool. so ultimately it was like an accessible place um it just made sense all things considered yeah but yeah, it awesome. was a it was a it was a challenging move. Um, we had CNC equipment to move. We had a, our whole team to move. We had a bunch of other equipment to move. It was a little easier, but it was pretty expensive. Had to coordinate like our facility, our, our rent, our, our electricians setting everything up. Our like the CNC. We had another CNC machine being delivered there, so a bunch of coordination, getting everything up and running as quickly as possible, so we didn't have too much downtime. Makes sense. What are yeah. you guys running for CNC machines? Uh, so we, we originally, like first we got a Haas VF2 SS, um, like CNC mill. And then when we like moved to Utah, we had already ordered, a um, a Haas STY or ST 15 Y lathe. Cool. If I'm remembering that correctly, I'd have to, I have to fact check myself That's, there. I'm pretty so sure it's good. an ST 15, but anyway, yeah. So those are, it's like two Haas machines. Great. Like mid tier far above a Tormach, but we don't need anything that's like much more than that. So yeah, it's perfect. Gives us a lot of internal capabilities. So sweet. Yeah, that's awesome. I, had you looked at all at like the thirty taper machines, like the uh, the brother Speedio or the Fanuc Robo Drill? <laughs> um, that I couldn't answer for you. Oh, that's no a worries. question. That's a question for my partner Joe because he he's the one like he he owns like our manufacturing more or less so I, i'd have to defer to him on that one but don't have all good sorry i didn't mean to ask too deep no you're fine that 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 stuff some like just for your knowledge too like are really specific like manufacturing questions i may not be able to answer but i'll do my best so all good all good yeah yeah um so being in salt lake do you guys have like a pretty decent robotics ecosystem i know you said it wasn't like kind of mixed but like what are the robotics companies are out there um what are like where do you recruit from like mm -hmm. the universities i'm assuming yeah yeah no that, that good question um there is not like a booming robotics ecosystem i would not say but um there is a really strong startup ecosystem there which is you know still valuable nonetheless i think i think utah has like the highest per capita unicorn companies actually as of last year or something like oh, some cool. or, or like one of the highest unicorn companies coming out of like the local universities anyway like really really strong startup statistics there yeah. um good ecosystem mostly in software but um sarcos is like the elephant in the room for robotics there and there's some smaller companies um but Sarcos is like the one, you know, and then there's yeah, a lot of an SK like, client too. So. Yeah, exactly. No, I know. And we, we talked about that a little earlier yeah. that we hope that they will be an Adirect client at some point. We think that, you know, our technology can help them possibly achieve some of their functional goals, which we don't know super intimately of, but yeah. And, and then there's a lot of like aerospace and defense operations in, in Salt Lake and the Utah area. So that's another, again, longer term, but still like relevant party. So. Cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, it um, seems like a pretty good market, aerospace and defense. I would imagine the um, regulatory, especially in aerospace, would be pretty challenging to yeah. the climb. Um, yeah. Same with medical, I guess. Or, or Yeah, it's, it, it's interesting because, like, medical's easier, for sure, for, for what we're doing. Like, because it's um, – so, so we're in – let's take the, the context of prosthetics – it's a class two medical device, but it's exempt from the FDA 510K. So oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. So it's actually 
essentially all you have to do is like self red like the company has to register it with the fda which really just means you provide a bunch of information they say okay this looks fine um but there's no like clinical trial requirements you you have to adhere to their um gmp good manufacturing processes um their quality standards right but there's no like huge regulatory process to get prosthetics approved i mean it's no small task to spin up a quality system though. no that that's true but it's also in comparison to aerospace where you have FAA certifications like to, to put in even a subsystem obviously within any type of aircraft that will leave the ground especially passenger aircraft is like minimum 18 month process to get your airworthiness stuff um, and all of the like aerospace specific quality systems as well which are I think more rigorous than GMP but I that I don't know exactly we, we yeah. and fortunately we do have we have an advisor specifically for FAA um, airworthiness stuff going cool. forward, and we have a manufacturing advisor specifically for those quality systems as well. So, yeah, those good quality people are hard to find. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I had the pleasure of working with someone who was on the podcast, Michelle Merwin, uh, and my previous employer, FormLogic, and she was pretty brilliant at that kind of stuff. Like, I feel like it could be boring, but she made it fun. Oh, cool! So, yeah. yeah, walked us through our AS ninety one hundred. Yeah, and that's that's the type of thing that. Fortunately, we, we do have the right person to help us with, I think, because that is a little bit over our team's heads. Like, we don't have any veterans from the aerospace industry or... or I don't know how to do it. Yeah, dude, it's, <laughs> it's a lot. And, and, and unfortunately, the documentation is, like, very unclear in some ways. So it's not, like, a quick Google search away or anything like that, you know? Yeah, I, I fully believe that. Um, and... I mean, you need like a QMS and, you know, you need to actually know how to set it up and then you have to undergo an audit and then you have to actually pass that audit. And yeah. 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 There's that's... a lot more steps that I don't know about. <laughs> so. Now that, that, that's actually something we'll be tackling next year is like really getting like QMS stuff like set up for, for a variety of reasons. Quality but... management system. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There you go. Thank you. Um, yeah. yeah. Try to define acronyms. Like no, that. no, that's, that's a good idea. That's but really I said idea. QMS before you did. So I think it's, it's, it's always perp. good to inform the audience for sure. Yeah. So cool. So, um, what are some of the other, I guess, um, applications you've found for your actuators, um, so far? Yeah, I think so. So first, like I said, we started in exoskeletons. Sure. We quickly transitioned kind of into prosthetic development specifically. And that was because even though I said like prosthetics, the regulatory is not that hard for exoskeletons, it's actually more challenging, surprisingly. And I won't go into that in too much detail, but switch to prosthetics. So a lot of like the human, human like movement uh, is, is a great fit for our technology because you have a lot of compliance. You have like just the natural motion type or sorry, muscle type motion, obviously. Um, so it, it, it fares very well in like bionics, you know, human centered robotics, right? And it's also super lightweight, really compact, which you need for those type of systems. But beyond that, um, most, we would like to think at least most mobile robotics might benefit from this just because like weight and size reduction is huge when you have like an untethered system. Um, you know, lighter weight either is going to give you more payload or longer range, you know, more battery capacity, like whatever it is, um, which is obviously always a big deal. And then another like really direct implementation is actually utilizing these in like a, an end effector, like as a gripper. Oh, cool. We can actually, um, there's a clever way to utilize or to use them as almost like a bending finger. So you can build like a claw out of these muscles oh, neat. and it contracts inward. Um, and gives you almost the capabilities of like a human hand. So you have like this universal gripper uh, that has the ability to grasp with extreme forces, yeah. uh, but also can do so very gently with force control. So you can get like a variety of, of different shapes, sizes, um, and weights of now, objects. Now, what is, that, is that like a different composite of muscle or is that, you know, just a clever implementation of the straight contracting muscle it it's the latter so what you can do is take this like the straight contracting muscle and if you brace the back side of it with like a, a flexible steel rod or a carbon rod or whatever it is when the muscle contracts it causes it causes that like um rod to bend and that curls the muscle inward um so you can set them up in like parallel like two sticking out like that 
and then when they contract it, the rods cause it to bend. Oh, inward. that's cool. Yeah. yeah, and that's already that's actually been proven already by some people in the past um, with this type of technology. So we know it works, and um, ours could hypothetically just be stronger, right, or or something lighter. You know, that's uh, the core of our innovation is improving on that technology. So that's awesome. Yeah. And then one of the other things we talked about is because hydraulics are kind of a pain in the ass. Um, you talked about having like a self-contained power system. What is what does that look like? Um, like I don't know. Like I guess in terms of the mechanism, and then in terms of like what that means for your end user. Mm -hmm. We've also like our supporting one of our supporting technologies is this like hydraulic power unit that's essential, right, to driving the muscles, and that's been one of the limiting factors. You either have this huge compressor, this huge hydraulic power unit powering the muscles, and that means it's not going to work well for an untethered system because you have this supporting power unit of some kind, right? Yeah. And we've built a really tiny version. Um, the exact like mechanisms or, or ways that it works, I won't describe in too much detail because we believe that it has some um, IP value, you know, right? But... Um, it's about, it provides like 200 watts. The standard version that we made provides 200 watts of continuous power, which is suitable for a lot of applications, like on a small scale. Um, and it's like smaller than a baseball and weighs less than a pound, right? Oh, so cool. it's like super small, uh, really lightweight, but uh, all it needs, it can be like a black box system. That, that gives us just like a full system. And we also, you know, build like some specialized valving to go along with it. So ultimately you get a really, you know, small, lightweight actuation system as a whole that only needs electricity right so cool yeah that eliminates a lot of like the the previous pains of hydraulics and our actuators don't leak of it, like in any way nothing leaks in any way because there's no dynamic seals um oh, that's which is another like big thing and there's no ingress there's no leaking there's no ingress either way so you yeah, don't you have can just glue it the fuck shut yeah pretty yeah you yeah. could i mean like the power unit you could technically just weld together and then the actuators you know you normally have a hydraulic cylinder has dynamic seals, like no matter what, you're going to lose fluid, you're going to have some sort of ingress eventually, like fluid contamination. Um, but this is bladder based. So there's no dynamic seals. There's like literally no way that there's fluid in or out or anything in or out until yeah. it completely fails. So that's that another like, like small benefit, but yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. We'd like to think so, you know? <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, that, that is neat. Um, when you say dynamic seals, I'm assuming you mean like that rubber bit that rides in a cylinder that eventually erodes or leaks, exactly. like you said. Yeah, yeah. No matter what, over time, you're going to have fluid slipping past that seal, like on the rod, or it's going to, like you said, erode and, and fail at some point, you know, and it'll either erode into the system, contaminate the fluid, or it'll just start releasing fluid, like to atmosphere. So. Which is also going to break the system because you'll, yeah. you'll bleed out. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So no matter what, that's like a, a huge problem with traditional hydraulic cylinders. Um, it, that's like I think ninety percent of hydraulic system failures are due to fluid contamination. That's like quoted from Caterpillar at some point in time. Interesting. So, um, you know, we think that this type of technology can solve that reliability problem, if nothing else. So, very cool. Hopefully. So, what's your? Um, I guess another question that comes to mind with me being a nerd is like. Um, how far do these things tend to contract? I mean, I'm guessing you probably have to have a longer length for a shorter stroke mm -hmm. than you would with a conventional cylinder. Yeah, and that's, I mean, I, I guess it just depends. But you are, like, definitely correct. Some cylinders will give you better stroke relative to their size, um, lengthwise at least, because we're capped. Or, we're like, fundamentally, physically capped at about 45% contraction. But our current design is capped at about 30% contraction. So... No matter what the length is, you're going to get about 30% of that at most. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. So there's some ways to, like, get around that, you know. Um, but that is one of, like, Compound the... Compound muscles, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, like, you can use, like, linkages to, to some sort of mechanical advantage to kind of fix that. Or um, you can technically wrap these around, like, a pulley because they're flexible. No. We don't have... We haven't tested that extensively, and we don't know how it fix, like uh, affects the fatigue life, right? It might fail like instantly. Who knows? Um, but you could also wrap it around like two pulleys, and then you've got, you know, maybe 80% contraction relative to its length or Pretty something sweet. like that. Yeah. yeah. It sounds like there's a lot of, lot of work to do there. 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there's a million, like I, I was talking about earlier, there's a million things that I would love for us to do if we had the resources to do so, but you know, got to pick and choose our, yeah, our for sure. battles yeah. right now. So especially like being a startup, even like large companies, I feel like get overextended and will, mm-hmm. you know, spend tons of money very, very quickly if they don't yeah. choose their battles as you put it. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. That's what business is, honestly, you know? Yeah. <laughs> limited resources and you got to make a profit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That makes sense to me. Cool. So, um, I guess, what do you think um, is kind of on the immediate horizon? Like, what are, I know you said prosthetics, mm-hmm. exoskeletons. Um, mm-hmm. Those are the big ones that stuck out. I guess there's also aerospace and the heavy equipment angle. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, which which market is next, do you think? Or is that not something you want to get into? No, that's that's fine. It's not some, It's something that I'll openly talk about for the most part. But, like, robotics, uh, like the non-human robotics is kind of the next easiest transition, right? Uh, because prosthetics or exoskeletons are really just robotics more like a, a robot of some kind right yeah, it's just attached to a human you know no matter what it's it's almost the same thing and most robotic systems don't have the regulatory or super intense like quality control barriers that come with aerospace and defense so yeah that's the next one robots you know cool yeah, yeah. And we're, we're working out of those yeah exactly i know and we're we're working we've been working a lot more on kind of developing that side of our business and we are hopefully going to have some more exciting kind of partnerships or customers technically in the robotics industry in the next like couple months. So sweet. Hopefully I'm excited yeah. to hear what those are. I know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we'll, 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 uh, I'll update you as, as it comes public, I guess. Right. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Really cool. All right. Well, I feel like that's like a pretty good overview of what Adaract is up to. Um, mm-hmm. How did you get into this role? Like what, what made you decide to, get into that business i guess do you have any other startups you did before this yeah. um like what kind of what kind of career have you led and, and how'd you get to where you are yeah yeah that, thank you that's a good question yeah, sure. um so i started working well actually like this is even before my first like real s- startup really in in college um and I briefly mentioned this to you before, but my com- my family started a tequila company, and nice. I helped a lot with that. Um, and it, like simple things, all, like in hindsight, it was pretty simple, right? Because I I wasn't like really running it a ton, but I did a lot of like the early work in like getting that going. Worked with my dad. It was mostly us like doing everything, and that was kind of the beginning. Doing a tequila company in Utah, awesome. um, you Hilarious. know, and I wasn't even twenty one. <laughs> I didn't even taste the samples because I wasn't twenty one technically, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so that was like kind of the beginning, and then the next like real startup that I had was uh, um, a, a B technology company, AgTech, right? Uh, yeah, and this you were was talking in, about this at dinner, but I want to hear about it on the podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I, uh, in my senior year of college, I and I had I had a friend for some time that was working in beekeeping. He was brokering you know, beehives between beekeepers and farmers who needed them for pollination. It's a whole thing that kind of like takes a while to explain, but essentially farmers in California need bees to pollinate their crop and they pay for it. Right. Oh, interesting. So he was like brokering that like very simple, just an intermittent party to connect those two. I know a bunch of beekeepers. I know a bunch of farmers. I'm going to take whatever percent and hook them up. Exactly. Pretty much. And then, you know, there was some opportunity to, branch out and actually develop meaningful technology within the beekeeping industry, because that is like an ancient, I mean, agriculture as a whole is a little behind the curve, but like beekeeping specifically is like ancient and not definitely not utilizing technology much at all. Um, which kind of makes sense, but was kind of surprised me even. So anyway, I, I joined my, my last year of college because we wanted to take an interesting approach to bringing technology into that industry. Uh, Most specifically, I was like building uh, machine learning software to predict the number of bees in a beehive based on infrared images taken externally. Ah. So it's like non-invasive inspection of beehives 
Um, the bees which, have like a lot of body heat that would make them show up on infrared imaging. Yeah, so th- yeah. there is like a way to to I correlate. I these were cold blooded. I feel like such a moron. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no. You can definitely it, the the hives rate like definitely radiate heat, yeah. um, and you can capture like d- like variances in that heat with you know really high quality infrared cameras, um, and the number of bees is more or less directly correlated to the the amount of heat it will put out and, and, and various other factors, right? Like oh, this cool. is a data problem, you know? Um, so there were other environmental factors we, we took into account. But um, yeah, when you traditionally, the way that this is some more like contextual industry backstory, but um, the farmers in California will pay. Um, thank you, thank you. The farmers in California will pay a certain amount for a beehive to rent a beehive based on its strength. And the strength really just is how many bees are in the hive, right? So um, historically, you have to crack open the hive um, and a, a, like expert beekeeper will look at it and be like, this is the strength of the hive. And it's ranked in number of frames from zero to whatever the total number of frames in the hive are. Anyway. Wait, um, so frames, like a frame is like one of those panes that has like- Exactly, bees on it. Yeah, and there's yeah. like a certain number in a hive there's different sizes, so it kind of varies. But but it doesn't matter how many bees are on a frame. You just rank it in terms of frames? Exactly. But the, huh. the, the frames are ranked as, like, number of frames based on the number of bees on each frame average, right? And that's something I don't understand personally as well because I'm not a beekeeper, right? Yeah. But I, I, I'm not a beekeeper either. <laughs> it's, it's kind of a, an, an awkward science that's subjective, right? But, but more importantly, when you open the hives, especially in the winter, which is right before almond season which is the biggest pollination season anyway it disrupts the hives kills the bees the hives can collapse entirely and die out so you want to do this non-invasively if possible yeah makes sense so that's why you know we did and another company actually does this still right now but but we were developing technology to take an external infrared picture of the hive and say and then you know we could go take a bunch of pictures run it through like our machine learning software it spits out a a, a list saying like these are all of the strengths of your hive and that people will pay for that because the farmers want to verify like, okay, I paid for this hive strength for my pollination because higher the strength, the better pollination they get. They want to say or verify that they got that strength that they paid for, right? Uh, so that's like a long-winded answer. And I would think eventually you could cut out the expert beekeeper and just go right to the software. Yeah, exactly. And that's that was kind of the, the goal um, because – like ultimately the farmers didn't have the capacity to inspect the beehives themselves, right? Cause they're not expert beekeepers. The beekeepers aren't going to do it for them because like they don't care. They're just going to say like, this is the strength of the hives I'm giving you take it or leave or like, trust me or not type of thing. Right. Um, so this was like a relatively affordable way, um, to do so through technology and we could do it like relatively rapidly as well. Um, but yeah, yeah, that's that's kind of that's what I was doing prior cool. to this. That's yeah. that's like a, a long long winded answer. No, that's, um, I mean, that's what I wanted to hear. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then, but yeah, that that was like the birth of like my true like entrepreneurial desires. Really, um, I, I guess like maybe before that in a variety of like smaller forms, but that was like the first like real startup, you know. Um, and I was like the second person in on that technically, you know. Um, cool. And then after that started like not started Adirac, but like joined Adirac as one of the founding members as we kind of moved from invention to like company as a whole and had full-time operations and then as Adirac was honestly like struggling financially and i hadn't been paying myself at all for like a long time as we do when we start company yeah yeah exactly but it, yeah and that was going on for a long time i'm like i gotta find a way to make some money to live and i started a car rental business in in reno cool um to service like the the travelers to tahoe and everything and 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 that was kind of like technically my most recent but not most intensive endeavor of any kind that's like just passively operating now like have some guys in reno doing that for me and adderact is like definitely like the the 100 or like 99.9 percent focus of life so cool yeah that's awesome what does it take to start a car rental company? Because that's not something I've done before either. Yeah, it's in addition a, to not being a beekeeper. I mean. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I, you don't want to be a beekeeper, honestly. It's it's a uh, it's, it's tough want. work. The beekeepers don't. I don't know how. I I'm like I I get stu- I have have been stung by many 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 bees in my life for some reason. They like <laughs> me, I guess. But um, yeah, well, beekeeping like is you. like or they don't like me either way. Who yeah. knows? Um, but yeah, beekeeping is is it's a it's a tough thing to get into. But aside from that, um, a car rental company. I mean, really, technically, at the core, all you need is a car, and the will to like or, or the the risk capacity to give someone that car and hope that they're not going to crash it you know um does insurance cover you or is that like not even begin to touch it like what people can do to that car personal insurance definitely will not cover you um (laughs) so i started out i got one car um and i rented on turo which you may be familiar with airbnb for cars right that's like the easiest way and for sure many many people do that i got made fun of for renting a mercedes on turo when i was in austin for uh, vertex Someone made, why would they make fun of you for that? Uh, it's like, because it was a Mercedes or because it was on Turo? Because it was a Mercedes. Oh. <laughs> well, you rented a Mercedes? What's wrong? I'm like, it was like $60. It's so cheap. Yeah. That, yeah. That's like, I mean, it's, it's really tough to like rent a business on Turo because it's too competitive, right? Um, but it's also great on the consumer side because it's, it's cheap. You can get like a, a five times better car than you can at Enterprise or Hertz on Turo. Yeah, um, that's what I was trying to do. Yeah, so, and that's that's like how I got started. And Reno ended up, and this was not like my, my forethought going in, but ended up being a really, really good market to do that because the local population is really small. So the competition is very low, but there's a huge um, number of travelers coming into Tahoe. Or for like, you know, various like conferences in Reno, like lots of stuff going on, but mostly Tahoe. Um, And they're generally like higher, uh, they're wealthier, you know, parties, honestly, all things considered as well, which ultimately leads to like more profitability as a car rental company. Anyway, it's like a good market to be in. Cool. Um, But yeah, it got one car, worked really well. Got another car, ended up working pretty well. And then, you know, kept scaling that to, we now technically have... Uh, eight cars. Nice. Which is still like kind of small. All I mean, like all things considered, kind of small. Do you do it outside um, of Toro now? Or? Yeah. So that's another thing. Like how did I started you earlier this year. That? Like how did you figure out how to actually carve out a market without? Yeah. That and that's much harder. Like yeah. Toro is like easy because people are already looking at it. You don't have to generate. Any, you don't need any marketing. You don't have to have any sort of exposure. It's just like a, a well orchestrated marketplace that you're a part of. Um, doing the private rentals is much more challenging because you need your own website. You need your own booking platform. You need like, obviously like payment processing. Uh, You need your own insurance, which was like, that took me a long time to find because insurance companies will like really hate insuring small commercial auto fleets. Like usually it's like 50 cars or more, Uh, but there's some specialized companies that I ended up finding. Um, But yeah, I, I just like, I put together a mediocre Squarespace website. Nice. Yeah. Um, Squarespace is where it's at. Yeah. Uh, did that and found... SK's website's a Squarespace. Dude, nice. Yeah, Ad- Adirect's website right now, also a Squarespace website. It's like, it's good enough for what we need at this point. So, yeah, exactly. Save um, some money. And I'm like capable of, of doing a decent job. So shout out to Squarespace. Great yeah, like best. tool for, for small businesses, right? Um, sponsored by Squarespace. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <Not really. laughs> Hopefully Please sponsor us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Maybe, maybe, maybe a future podcast, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, but, but did that found a, 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 a so, like essentially a software company that builds like platforms for rental, like small rental car operations and started using that, um, plugged it into the website, started Google advertising, and that's about all. Got the got the insurance in, and it was slow, but it ramped up pretty quickly. And the private rentals are now like roughly fifty percent of our our sales, our volume. So, oh, that's cool. Which is good because it's worth th- like there's no fee from Turo, right? The prices are higher generally because Turo's competitive, and the prices are actually lower. And we now make the money on insurance premiums and and some other things. So that's awesome. Yeah. It's, it's much better to be on that side of things. It honestly. sounds challenging to get that, get that cracked. So, I mean, it's pretty cool. To yeah. Be able it, to set that it up. took some, it was like many late nights or very early mornings while trying to like, obviously focus on Adderact, but out of, <laughs> out of necessity, like trying to build a, a secondary source of like, most people just, would just get a job. I mean, I feel like that's, <laughs> well, this was like, it was, well, this was like less commitment. It was uh less time out of my day and it was, yeah 
more interesting. I don't know, more exciting and more no, sustainable it's, it's cooler, long term. Sure. Yeah, so it's like, um, yeah, definitely more sustainable long term because fortunately now, like this, this still exists, and I don't hardly spend any time on it because people I have operators now, and and it's it's kind of just going on its own more or less, you know. Um, That's but cool. Yeah, yeah, it's good, and and it's I I now also have the the interesting advantage of very easily buying like business vehicles because it's a car <laughs> rental company, so it's very hard to, um, you know, for for the IRS to say like that's not a business vehicle if it's for a car rental company and it's like a rentable car. So yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, it's, <laughs> uh, that's a, a, a niche advantage that I I plan to hold going forward. You know, but. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, no, that's that's super cool. I actually am I'm pretty fascinated by that story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. The yeah. Starting the website, figuring out the platform, getting the insurance. I mean, that is Yeah, it it was a real entrepreneurship. That's I I hope so. Yeah, I guess so. That's like I can't imagine doing anything else now, I guess mm-hmm. at a certain point. It's like if if everything fails, I I would only try to find the way to build something else, I guess, you know. Yeah, no, I I you know, it's funny. My parents have always given me a lot of crap for that, you know, and, and I mean, I think I'm just stuck with it now, but I mean, I'm making more money than I would be making if I had a job probably that was like just as an employee mm-hmm. and they still give me shit for it. <laughs> <They're> still, <laughs> like, you know, like, well, you get, I'm like, I'm doing fine. Yeah. <laughs> like, leave, leave me alone. Yeah. I, I think, I think there's like an internalized notion of, yeah. of how, that can be like a struggle, you know, um, which it can yeah. be. I'm sure it was like for you even for, for sure. For some yeah. Time, right. And I think they're, they're grasping Starting a new onto thing that, is always you know? a struggle. I mean, and, but that's why you, you do it because it matures and becomes better than, than what you could have had otherwise. Yeah, you suffer you know? for a bit, you know, yeah. you, you, you deal with less. I mean, you, you work really hard and, yeah. you know, if it's you get lucky and, you know, do a good job, then, you know, you have something that continues to earn money mm-hmm. and, a job the, you really enjoy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the trade-off is either you enjoy it, hopefully, and it's more fulfilling, or you get to a point where you don't need to work anymore, and you can like hire other people to kind of do your work for you. But you can't, you can't outsource. Well, you can, you might be able to, but you can't easily outsource your work at a corporate job. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. Did but. you hear about the guy that did that with Microsoft? Though I, I feel like that was like a big scandal like ten years ago. I that's not surprising. I, yeah. I can't. I'm not at all surprised. I know. Like I've heard. I've read stories about people like double dipping, having like two full time jobs during yeah. like with remote work, and they would, you know, like kind of skimp through like two jobs at the same time, get paid double essentially <laughs> for like barely, like showing up. I guess showing up just enough not to get fired. But I think that's like technically illegal in, in a capacity somehow. But I know people do that. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if people are. Are yeah, like trying to hire someone in in a non U.S. country to like do. I think that's work what for. it was with Microsoft. Was it was the the person was offshoring their own job. Yeah, yeah, which yeah. is clever, but I think dis dishonest. Obviously, yeah, <laughs> <It's, laughs> uh, maybe um, maybe ethically wrong. I don't know. I mean, SK but. hires a lot of moonlighters. We we had a person one time who was uh, full time at at a major outfit i'll say i won't say where mm-hmm. but um they were logging a 65 hour week with us while they were full-time at this outfit and i believe that they were doing 65 hours of work with us because i saw their work output yeah and i remember um you know i'm like how are you doing that they're like obviously i'm slagging off my other job <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, she told it. yeah you're like uh, all right yeah, you're uh, paying me by the hour they aren't <laughs> so yeah yeah as long as they deliver it's kind of yeah. like eh, what, what else are they gonna do i mean yeah that kind of makes sense, I guess. Um, yeah. Good for you guys. Good for that person. They were putting, they were grinding. Yeah, I'm sure if they're working a full time job at uh, some legitimate company that will not be named, I guess, and yeah. 65 hours a week for you guys, they were they were making a little bit of money and getting yeah, they some, paid off a bunch of stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I I, uh, I can't imagine what that that resume would look like. You know, it's like their next employer. Maybe they're looking at this. They're like, so you worked at a. You know, for for example, there you worked at Google for this period, and you also you're saying you worked sixty hours a week at this company, and these are the projects you did. That doesn't really make any sense. <laughs> Might be like a challenging interview because they're like, can you can you explain 
why or like how this is possible. And they're like, well, I didn't really do my job at, at my Google. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. <laughs> I didn't re- <laughs> yeah. It may not go over super well if you're interviewing for another similar position, but uh, <laughs> I'd imagine you just have to like white out that one on your resume and yeah. it doesn't get included or in- gets included. It's like a passion project or something. Right. But yeah. Yeah. Or like you just mess with the timeline. So you're like, yeah, yeah I did this awesome project, but you don't say when you did it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> No, but I mean that that person does have an impressive resume. I mean, I would say not the company that they were slagging off. Raytheon, um, University of Michigan, Carnegie Mellon Field Robotics Center, and then another one that they slagged off. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> but that that was their prior experience. Yeah. No, these these are I referred or them other. into the Field Robotics Center. Then from there they springboarded to Raytheon. Okay. Oh, cool. And, yeah. Very exciting. And then they did this other company that I won't name. And then they went to the University of Michigan. Okay, nice. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, hopefully, no, no one's gonna backtrack on that and expose the. That's uh, not a. Big Even if it anyway. got out, like I feel like I probably don't no. have to redact that piece of information. No, uh, definitely not. It's a massive outfit, but you know, I don't know. Just, just in case. Long term, like say Adirac makes you know fifty billion dollars and you're able to retire. Yeah. What would you do, like, if you could do anything? Uh, would you just stop working? Would you create a space company? Would you? Um, <laughs> yeah, that, that's like the default answer, right? Yeah, it's right. like, yeah, I've been successful. Let's go build a rocket, you know? Yeah. Which I kind of get. It's cool, you know? But that's funny you comment on that. I've actually yeah. had the thought of how many atypical individuals have just started space companies and, you know, like <laughs> raised a bunch of money. It's like, anyway, it seems, seems strange for people to be getting into it. But, um, my answer to that is I would, I would probably stop working for a minute, you know? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah if, I think if, those if, other people did that too for a minute, right? Yeah. That's like, if, yeah. if everything, you know, goes well and Adirect, we sell Adirect or something or like some, something happens and I have a lot of money and freedom. I, yeah, I would go travel with my, my girlfriend or my family or whoever it is, my friends for six months, but I, it would drive me insane. I think I would be like, I need to fucking do something. Yeah. It makes sense. Sorry. Edit that out. If I'm not supposed to say, you can say fuck on this podcast. Okay, I mean, you don't have to. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I won't intentionally do so, but I, yeah. it's that one slipped a little bit. But, um, after I, I got tired of like slacking off for some time, I would start a restaurant. I would at least try to, or like, I, I really would love to pursue something in food. Um, as we talked a little earlier, like I like to cook, you like to cook. Yeah. I love eating great food and I love the experience that that can be. Um, and I would love to like create that for other people. Awesome. Um, that's like a huge thing. I would obviously try my best to enable anything and everything that like my family and friends or, and girlfriend would like to do that needed financial resources, you know, um, and give them the opportunity to pursue something that was like meaningful to them, you know? Um, and in another thing that I like wanted to do much more in past years of my life, but not as much anymore is like pursue like fashion and design oh, in cool. that sense. And right now I I'm like dressed like, like my dad is going to sue you, you know, but, <laughs> but, <funny>. uh, <laughs> but that, that's only cause we're at like a professional event. And generally I, I like have a, I, 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 not as much anymore, but I care like a lot actually about like fashion and design, like clothing design, or I have historically. Oh, cool. So that's another thing I would like maybe pursue more on a personal basis. But yeah, food and fashion are like that's awesome. two things I like and traveling would be huge, but that's like less of a, a long-term desire and pursuit. So it's not really a job so much as a thing you do. Yeah, it's just a thing to do. But, but other than that, yeah, like food would be a huge one. I think that's something I, I still, I want to do no matter what happens, even if Adirect isn't worth a billion dollars, you know, maybe... 50 million even like start a restaurant or something but cool yeah yeah that's awesome yeah do you have any idea what genre of restaurant you would start or is that tbd um i don't know that's hard it's not something i'd like thought thought of too heavily like i i, I would it would probably be something italian or italian adjacent of nice. some kind um what does italian I, adjacent mean i i i just feel like there's many restaurants now that don't have like a distinct theme but they have a lot of italian inspired dishes you know at least that's like my opinion they have like a kind of a it's not like a traditional italian restaurant but like you know they like have, you went through tonight 
Yeah, exactly. It's not like that, but it's it's like they'll they'll have like a lot of pastas. A lot of the appetizers will be like Italian in nature of some kind. You know, like yeah. a, a burrata with with prosciutto and melon is becoming a much more common appetizer. It's very delicious. Yeah, it's it's great. But that's yeah. like an Italian dish that is now appearing on many menus, right? Um, so something like that. But I would also, if it was possible, I would love to build a restaurant in in Salt Lake, for example, that was like a prefix menu. Oh, cool. Um, because there's only like one restaurant that I know of in Salt Lake that does like a prefix menu that has multiple courses and all of that. And like a really heavy emphasis on creating a few things perfectly instead of the Cheesecake Factory approach, you know? Which they make everything half acid. Yeah, exactly. And that, <laughs> that that pisses me off personally. That's like one of my pet peeves of a restaurant is, you know, trying to do too much but not doing anything well. Yeah. Um, and I would love to create like a very directed like prefix menu that was Italian inspired or full Italian that like really perfected everything, hopefully. And then, cool. you know, maybe become the first Michelin star in, in Utah. Right. Nice. That'd be awesome. <laughs> that That's like the there's ultimate never been long... a Michelin star in Utah. Not that I know of. I don't think there's any in Pittsburgh that I know of. Either. Yeah. It, it's like when you really look at the U S there's only, it's like, you have like Las Vegas, a few places in California, New York, maybe Chicago, Miami, Chicago's got to have Michelin stars. Yeah, I, I think there's at least one or two. But, yeah, it's like Salt Lake's not big enough, yeah. no, nor do they have enough of a focus on food. Do you think that's like the Michelin people being pretentious and, like, only going to certain cities? Or do you think that's genuinely not um, as good of food being in those cities? I think that you have a lot of sourcing problems yeah. in smaller cities. Like, you, do, you just don't have access to the best ingredients, yeah. nor do you have access to the best culinary talent. Yeah, so sense. I think those two things together probably end up – and you also need the commercial viability. Like you can't – starting a Michelin restaurant with prefix menus that are $300 a, a night is hard in a city that isn't New York, right, or, or L.A. That. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so it's like you're – like are you actually going to be able to survive financially? That makes um, sense. There was a really good sushi place that I frequented in grad school called Fukuda here in Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. and it was, it was awesome. The chef was uh, – white guy from utah but he trained in uh japan um, okay and he actually worked for the yakuza <laughs> that was training <laughs> nice yeah yeah he, it, but it's like three years of like he was fluent in japanese i mean he understood classic japanese cuisine um he was hilarious um degenerate drunk but that was <laughs> fun um, as as can be typical in a lot of like successful yeah. chefs or, or similar you know yeah for sure <laughs> And um, I, I I really enjoyed going there like as much for his stories as for the food, but the food was very very good. Yeah. And um, that place did not survive in this town. Like it, it they they ran out of money. Like I, I was I think I was their third biggest client as a grad student. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that that's sad. It's like you you do see a lot of things fail possibly because it's like it's any business. You know, it's like if you're not in the right market, it's gonna fail. Right? You don't have the right money. That, that's one of the interesting things that, like, you could do with unlimited resources, hypothetically, is you could just, like... Prop it up. Do what you want to, and it doesn't matter how much money you lose forever, right? Yeah. And, and that's... that's I feel like I might do that. Like, if I started a restaurant with a bunch of money, I probably wouldn't be too worried about making a lot of money. I would just be like, yeah, we're just going to do this because... Don't seem to tend to be cash cows. I mean, maybe sometimes, but... I, they can be, I think, with the right structure, but I don't think, like, the greatest restaurants are the most profitable, you know? That makes I, sense. Like it, McDonald's is doing great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Chick-fil-A makes like a quadrillion dollars, right? Yeah. But they're not like the best food. They're good, but I think that's all you need to be to be commercially they successful. They don't have a Michelin star. Yeah, exactly. I don't, I don't think most of the Michelin-starred restaurants are making a lot of money. They're just like existing Skirt for the by. experience, which is incredible. Like, honestly, yeah. that's like commitment to art more or less. But Yeah, yeah. I, could, I could dig that. All right, so um, you talk about Michelin star restaurants being a commitment to art, which I think they are. I mean, and just a really good restaurant in general. I love a good sushi place. Um, I have not been to any Michelin star restaurants. I'll be honest. Mm -hmm. Always like I've only, I've only been to one, so it's like I I just I don't have a a plethora of experience. You know? I feel like but it's like twelve hundred bucks, right? And you're like, it's not it's not that much. It doesn't have to be that much. I think it can be, but um, I would like. I went to Europe like somewhat recently and they have a lot of Michelin star restaurants there and there's a range. It can be as, as little as 150 oh, yeah, dollars ish, right? For like a seven, five or seven course meal. It can be like, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, but 
Anyway, the barrier to entry isn't actually crazy, but it's hard to find in the States, like generally yeah. speaking. You know, that's fair. I was in Bogota, Colombia recently, and there were a bunch of them, and it was like probably like 300 bucks, but mm-hmm. there's like 18 or 19 Michelin star restaurants in Bogota. Yeah, and that's, I feel like that's a lot, actually, like for in Colombia? In Bogota, Colombia in particular. Okay, interesting. Yeah. It's like culinary capital of like. I mean, they South they had America, a bunch maybe? of them, yeah. Huh. I, I I don't know if that's like common in that part of the world. No, but, but go like when you get a chance, go because like I, it's honestly worth it. It was okay. really like a different experience than I have ever. So like had. that that Michelin star actually means something. it really okay. does. I I I thought that it I might be, be a like gimmicky thing. Yeah. I think it can be. You know, yeah. it might it might be at times, but the like the place that I went to was was definitely like a different experience that i've ever had in a really cool cool way like it was unique the food was incredible it was served in a bunch of tiny courses right but it actually like filled me up and it it was a it was a cool experience that i like feel 100 percent good about spending that much money on you know and i would definitely recommend like anyone who has a chance to do that um and i cannot wait until i might have the next time of like the next opportunity to do that again i'll have to to give it a go especially if you 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 like food i know you do i do go do it like give it a shot yeah i'll spend like 150 bucks on sushi like pretty frequently yeah yeah it's like like, why not take that and spend it on michelin star exactly (laughs) dude yeah if you you can find a place like that isn't crazy like yeah go do it for sure or like i mean two of those and spend it on a 300 dollars michelin star exactly Yeah. yeah cool awesome all right, well, so I think this might be a good point to kind of taper off um, as we near the end of the episode. Is there anything you want to plug? Honestly, I don't, I don't know the audience, like, specifically. But, it's a lot uh, of nerds and, like, roboticists. Yeah, and... pl- okay, yeah. If, that, if, that's the, if that's the audience, I first want to say, I want to, like, say thanks to my team because they're fantastic. Like, my partners, Joe, Francis, and Clay are all incredible. But then to plug more specifically, anyone watching this who wants to try some, like, really incredible incredible alternative actuators, artificial muscle actuators, as we talked about earlier, um, for weight reduction, size reduction, um, cost reduction in your robotic systems, please do reach out. And we also are fairly soon launching our hydraulic power unit as, like, an independent product um, as like a super lightweight, compact HPU alternative to anything like way smaller than anything else that exists. Cool. So those are our two things that we would love to get in the hands of people to work with and try and test and play around with. So sweet. Um, watching this, what's, what's the best way to get a hold of you? Uh, email me at Marcus, M A R C U S at Adaract, A D A R A C T.com. Sweet. Yeah. Appreciate you coming on. Awesome. Thanks, Spencer. Thank you, Marcus. Yeah. Thanks for joining us today. If you made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krause is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krause is sponsored by SKA Custom Robots and Machines. If you're in the market for robotics contract engineering services, please consider hiring SK Custom Robots and Machines. They sponsor this podcast and they solve some of the toughest engineering challenges in the world. SK Custom Robots and Machines can be found at ska.solutions. Thanks again and see you on the next one.